Welcome to this special edition of Context. City centres have become synonymous with violent attacks. 9-11, Paris, Brussels, we live in a violent time. Is religion responsible for some of this violence and threats? We take up that question next. Tackling violence and our faith has earned our first guest the world's most prestigious prize for progress in spirituality and religion, the 2016 Templeton Prize. With special thanks to our friends at the Canadian think tank Cardis, we had a chance to speak with Templeton Prize winner Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. I began by asking Rabbi Sachs how he defines what it means to be spiritual. Tell us how you define the spiritual. Somehow or other, this great faith of Abraham that Jews, Christians, and Muslims share comes to us with this radical thought that there is a presence vaster than the universe, but closer to us than we are to ourselves. And somehow or other, that comes to me personally in all sorts of ways, yeah. from our sacred texts, from the beautiful natural universe around us, but from a very strong sense that uh, it's no accident that we're here yeah. with these gifts in this time, in this place. And I'm constantly trying to listen to what God wants from us here now. You use the term altruistic evil, that is hating in the name of the God of love, killing in the name of the God of life, cruelty, in the name of the God of compassion. How do we stop altruistic evil? I wrote Not In God's Name actually in the wake of 9-11, but it took me about 10 or 15 years to get it right. And I knew I had to write it when after the summer of 2014, we saw for the first time the barbarities of the group called ISIS or ISIL, which really was, you know, butchering Christians, uh, beheading aid workers, setting fire to a Jordanian pilot. Crucifying we had a, children. Crucifying children. We had a case uh, in March on the Ivory Coast where tourists were shot and a five-year-old Christian boy who was begging for his life was shot at point-blank range by somebody shouting the words, God is great. Now, this is one of the most horrendous uh, episodes of all time, let alone of our time. And I think when people commit violence in the name of God, people of faith, of any faith, have to get up and say, God is telling us right now, this is not sanctity but sacrilege. This is not in God's name. And let's just go to Cain and Abel. What do we learn about the roots of religious violence from sibling rivalry and the Cain and Abel story? The Bible is very honest with us. It tells us from the very beginning, don't think religion is always guaranteed to produce love and light. The very first religious act recorded in the Bible, an offering by the first two human children, Cain and Abel, leads to the first act of violence, of murder. And God saying to Cain, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And you argue that it doesn't make any sense to apply the sibling rivalry theory to God because God never runs out of love. There's room for all of us. But how do we apply the theory of God's love to the people who are involved in extremist radical Islamism? One way that Islam sees itself in relation to Jews and Christians is we are descendants of Ishmael and Jews and Christians are descendants of Isaac, the two sons of Abraham. So you see that very act of self-definition creates sibling rivalry between the faiths and hence the possibility of violence. And when that happens, we have to go back to the Bible and say, are we really reading these stories the right way? Because 
on the surface, they really are stories of sibling rivalry. But if you look a little beneath the surface, you'll see the book of Genesis is almost forcing us to have sympathy with Ishmael as well as Isaac. Mm. God is with Ishmael as well as with Isaac. And so that's a deeper reading of those texts. With Leah as well as with Rachel. With Leah as well as with Rachel, you know. Jacob and Jacob loves Rachel more than Leah. But God listens to Leah more than Rachel. Leah has the children. She has uh, the, f you know. So somehow or other, God listens to the ones who feel rejected. Now, it's clear that young Muslims feel rejected, so they have angry feelings. And I'm saying, let's all go back and read these stories again, and you'll see that actually God doesn't reject anyone. It's not you against me, it's both of us as brothers and sisters under the parenthood of God. So let's quote your theory in a tweet. Here it goes. God's love is not in short supply is the theology for the 21st century. How do people access God's love? I think the first thing you do when you connect with God's love is you realize, I don't have to prove anything. He loves me the way I am. So I don't have to pick up arms and defeat my enemies. I can put down the arms and love my enemies. And the end result is we have a much more beautiful world and much more respect for religion. So all these people who are committing acts of violence in the name of the religion are not making God's name great. They're making God's name reviled. So I think these really religious young people have to hear altruism driving them to good, not to evil. You predict religion will grow in the 21st century. Why? For one obvious reason, religious people have more children than anyone else. So by the mere demographics, religious populations are going to be much bigger by the end of the 21st century than they were at the beginning. So that's going to happen absolutely regardless. But it's also because the secular societies of the West don't really answer the three big questions everyone asks at some stage. Who am I? Why am I here? How then shall I live? Those are the big religious questions. So religion will never, ever become obsolete. You know, there are many critics that argue religion is the problem and we should just get rid of it. You don't agree. Why? Well, I don't think that's the answer because in the 19th century, enlightened, emancipated Europe said, let's get rid of religion, or at least let's stick it in the back room. And let's build identity on something other than religious faith. And so 19th century Europe came up with three substitutes for religion. One of them was called the nation state. Let patriotism be our driving force. Another one, especially in Germany, was the race. We are proud of our racial origins. We are the Aryan race. And the third substitute for religion was political ideology, Marxist communism. Let's bring the messianic age politically instead of religiously. So those were the three great substitutes for religion in the 19th century. The results in the 20th century were the worship of the nation state caused two world wars. The worship of the race brought about the Holocaust. The worship of the political ideology brought Stalin and the Gulag. 100 million people died as a result of those three substitutes for religion. The cause of violence is not religion. The cause of violence is human beings. And so whether we're religious or we think of a substitute for religion, we still have to beware of the violence. Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, author of Not in God's Name, Thank you very much for being with Context and thank you for your leadership and your wonderful ideas. Well, thank you and bless you. The U.S. recently labeled as genocide the targeting of Christians and other religious minorities by ISIS. In a new documentary, Faith Keepers, profiles the tragedy. Paula Queskin is the producer of that documentary and she's also an expert in human rights law. She joins us today from Jerusalem. 
The U.S. has declared violence and crimes against Christians and other minority groups in Iraq and Syria as a genocide, but Canada has not. What difference does it make for countries to name this violence genocide? Well, I think it's very important that when we name things, then we can create a solution to them. I think without naming a problem, um, it leaves us without the context, it leaves us without the tools at our disposal. And after World War II, after the Holocaust, um, there was a gentleman who pushed to have the Genocide Convention created, an attorney, a t attorney named Lemkin. And this was his life's work, to push to create the Genocide Convention, to give a name to the atrocities that he had witnessed through the Holocaust. Well, let's take a look at Faith Keepers and what people can expect. The current status of Christians and other non-Muslim minorities throughout the Middle East is the worst it's been in centuries. 21 people were killed when a powerful bomb exploded in front of a Coptic Christian church. Muslim mobs began attacking Christian churches. They are targeting churches, temples, cultural and historical sites. What can be done to stop this kind of violence? Well, it's, it's an incredibly complex problem. I think I'd go back to the first thing I said, which is that we really need to name the violence, name the atrocities, and not be scared to point to the groups and the individuals and the ideology behind the violence. Only when we name things and we name problems can we then move forward to find solutions. So that's... That's very important. So Paula, what are you calling this kind of violence? Well, this is Islamist extremism. This is the, using religion as a tool, as a weapon to persecute, to rape, to torture, to pillage, using religion as a tool to do this, um, to excuse it and to perpetrate it. It's very important that we start calling this what it is, which is religiously motivated persecution. Well, the irony is that religious persecution is happening through religious-inspired violence. And are you finding people who are working to stop that? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's what's incredible, is that you have some of the strongest voices coming within the Muslim community. So, for example, a Canadian, Canadian-Pakistani woman, Raheel Raza, who worked with me on Honor Diaries, is one of the strongest examples of a Muslim woman who speaks about this, who calls it what it is, calls it Islamist extremism, and says we've got to name this in order to change it. But you also have other groups, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, who are working together. So, for example, in northern Iraq, um, the Kurdish government and other um, government officials and NGOs are working all the time to help protect Christians, um, Yazidis, other minorities. They're Muslim as well. So I, I think it is important that we name um, the source of the violence, but that that shouldn't prevent us from working with interfaith groups to try to find solutions. What do you think some of the solutions are? Well, we're on the right path in the sense, like I said, of naming this a genocide. That's certainly the first step. But there also needs to be a grassroots movement throughout the United States, throughout Canada, throughout Europe, where people should be connected to this issue. Um, this is happening to Christians primarily and in terms of the religious violence. And so I'm waiting on the Christian community in the United States to really raise their voices and to get connected to this issue. That's definitely one element. I think we've got to keep the pressure strong on our elected officials. We saw how that worked in pushing John Kerry, the State Department, the Obama administration to name this a genocide. Also, the House of Representatives unanimously declared this a genocide. And that was a direct result of pressure from the people. Um, so if we want to see continued change and actual solutions come into play, then we've got to keep the pressure up. So how has documented this suffering, this genocide, changed you, Paula? I'm absolutely heartbroken every time I hear of yet another violent act. Um, it's very frustrating. 
uh, definitely keeps me up at night. Um, but it's also inspiring to meet um, different individuals working all over the world towards repairing the world and trying to make a difference. And I just feel very humbled and blessed that I have friends in Iraq and, uh, you know, all over the world, in Canada, in Turkey, I mean, you name it, different individuals, very strong men and women who are pushing to make a difference. Your documentary, Faith Keepers, has the power to wake us up. If someone wants to get involved in helping prevent violence against Christians, against religious minorities, how do they begin? Well, please go to faithkeepersmovie.com. It's one word, faithkeepersmovie.com. Um, we'll be coming out later this year, but already we're starting the movement where folks can get involved, they can get connected to humanitarian aid projects and start to tell your churches and your communities about this important effort because it's not just the movie, it's also the surrounding movement. Paula Kweskin, producer of Faith Keepers, thank you for joining us from Jerusalem. Coming up, Sheldon Neal sits down with Nabil Qureshi to discuss jihad and violence in Islam. Sheldon Neal sat down with New York Times best-selling author Nabil Qureshi to discuss jihad and violence in Islam. Nabil is the author of Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus and Answering Jihad, A Better Way Forward. You grew up Muslim in America and understand Islam from the inside, that personal connection. Um, Islam is often misunderstood in North America. Um, give us some insight, what is jihad and how is that connected to what we're seeing um, with ISIS and groups like Al-Qaeda? Jihad is something that has existed since the beginning of Islam. Now, as a Muslim being raised in the West, I had been taught by my elders, by my imams, that Islam was a religion of peace and that any of the fighting that Muhammad did or that featured in early Islamic history was defensive. So that's how I understood jihad as a Muslim in the West. And so when I said Islam was a religion of peace to the people around me, I truly meant it. But when you actually open up the pages of Quranic history and you study the life of Muhammad, what you find is that jihad, though it can mean something peaceful, though it can mean an internal struggle uh, for, for holiness, the reality is the vast majority of the time the word is used, it was used to depict a violent struggle for the sake of establishing Islam. Whether defensively or offensively didn't really enter into the equation, uh, but it was to promote Islam's superiority. And that's exactly what we find in chapter 9, verse 33 of the Quran. So even though we often assume that in the West Islam is a religion of peace and that jihad was a defensive endeavor, it really is a violent struggle from the foundations of Islam. We see all this violence on television, we read about it in newspapers, you know, on and on. And the average person tends to think and ask themselves, you know, what has gone wrong with Islam? How do you weigh into that? When we see the violence uh, that surrounds us, uh, San Bernardino being attacked uh, and uh, Toronto coming under attack and uh, New York coming under attack, DC, all these things within the past few months, um, we ask the question, what, what has happened here? And a lot of people will ask, what's wrong with Islam? What has happened to Islam? But the fact is, what we're seeing across the world is what I call the Islamic Reformation. Muslims around the world uh, are asking themselves why Islamic societies have lost the favor of Allah. After the Ottoman Empire fell at the end of World War I, there remained no major Islamic global power. And so Muslims started asking themselves, what must we do in order to regain the favor of Allah such that we'll have power again? And the answer they came up with was, let's follow the Quran, let's follow the Hadith. One organization that did that, for example, is called the Muslim Brotherhood, established in 1928 on those two principles. And from that flows out Al-Qaeda, and from Al-Qaeda, of course, ISIS, Boko Haram comes out from the same ideology. What these people are trying to do is follow Islam in a world that has seemed to have lost its Islamic foundation. You've studied both the life and teachings of Muhammad and Jesus. Uh, give us a picture. How do they differ, both men? Jesus lives very peacefully. He tells one to love his enemies, uh, and he's God incarnate, uh, pre-existent. 
according to the Christian faith. In the Islamic faith, Muhammad is none of those things. Uh, he does use violence when needed um, or when it might advance the cause of Islam. And that has always been fine in Islamic history. Uh, he is not God incarnate, far from it. He says that God cannot become incarnate. Uh, he carries a sword quite frequently. He himself participates in battles. In the last nine years of his life, he commissions or participates in 86 battles. That's more than nine per year. And so Muhammad is a 7th century statesman, general, diplomat, whereas Jesus is a 1st century religious teacher and God incarnate, according to Christians. What does Jesus teach about violence? And Jesus teaches that violence is the way of this world. Uh, it, it's fascinating to, to watch Jesus. He does pretty much the opposite of what everyone expects. Uh, when, when a prostitute comes before him and, and cries at his feet, instead of sending her off, he welcomes her and loves her. Uh, when uh, a rich man comes to him that should be accorded honor, he says, no, the rich will not inherit the kingdom. He shocks everyone time and time again. When it comes to violence, his disciples assume that he's going to fight. That is why uh, Peter pulls out the sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. He assumes this is the time the Messiah is going to defend the Jewish people and liberate it from the Romans. The fact of the matter is, though, Jesus says the exact opposite. He's willing to die for the sake of even his enemies. So Jesus tells us that in order for us to follow him, we need to love others as he has loved people. As I have loved you, so love one another, says Jesus in John 15. And so if Jesus is willing to lay down his life for the sake of others, he's telling us to be willing to do the same. And that's why the Sermon on the Mount says, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other also. If they take your cloak from you, give him the tunic. If they say walk one mile, go ahead and walk two. He wants to transform the world through a radical, unprecedented, backwards in the world's view perspective. But someone could be watching this and they're thinking, you know, but Christians are also guilty and of committing and have done violence in the name of their God too. So how do you respond to that? And that being on the issue of religious violence that, you know, essentially all religions in some way are the same, equally guilty of this same thing, the same act. How do you weigh in? There is no question that Christians have committed violence. There's no question that there are hateful Christians. We can turn on the news and see that even today. Uh, the issue that I'm pointing out with Islam is not that there are terrorists. Yeah, that wouldn't prove anything at all. There are violent people in every tradition. What I'm pointing out is that the violence is inherent in the inception of the faith, the canonical texts, the Quran and the Hadith. We look at the holy scriptures of Islam, the message culminates in violence. It starts out peaceful, and so when people point to peaceful passages, like Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 256, which says, La ikraha fid deen, there's no compulsion in religion. Uh, they say, look, it's peaceful. Well, that's how the message started out. But by the time it was finished, the last major chapter of the Quran is Surah 9, chronologically, and it's the most violent. And so the violence is laced into the tradition. In fact, it culminates in violence. That's what separates the Christian tradition from the Islamic tradition, is that there is no violence whatsoever in the New Testament, whereas violence is woven into the Islamic message. What led you to leave the faith of your family and give your life to Jesus and follow the path he teaches? That's a great question because a lot of former Muslims have uh, left Islam out of anger uh, or out of hatred or out of disgust or have, after having been abused. I had none of that. I loved Islam. I was raised to love Islam. I loved praying five times a day. I loved fasting. I loved watching for the new moon to come out so that I knew the month of Ramadan had started. I loved my culture and my heritage and I loved the Muslims around me. The fact is, Islam makes certain claims about God. It makes certain claims about Jesus and the world. And when we investigate those claims, we find them to be very problematic. At the same time, it makes certain claims about Muhammad, that he's a prophet of Allah, that he's the most perfect man who ever lived. And when you study Muhammad's life critically, you find, at least I did, that he was not a man I wanted to follow. And so for me, it was a search for truth that led me out of Islam and towards the Christian faith. Nabil Qureshi, author of Answering Jihad, A Better Way Forward. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks so much for having me. So our question for you on our topic this week is this, how do you think religion should respond when its members are violent? It's a tough question, but we want to know what you think. Write to us by email at comments at contextwithlorna.com or call us at 1-800-215-4913. How should religion respond when its members are violent? 
can email that answer to comments at contextwithlorna.com or post your comment on our Facebook or Twitter. Coming up, some final thoughts on viewing violence from God's perspective. So we ask today, how often is religion to blame for violence we see in the world? And where it is, what is the solution? Rivalry and the temptation to use violence lurks in every human heart. And I love the challenge we had from Rabbi Sachs. The new theology, he said, for the 21st century is that God has enough love for us all. And that's why to reach real peace, we need a radical change of heart. God's transformation that helps us see each other as loving siblings, not riving factions. For the Christian, that change comes through Jesus. Jesus, who suffered the ultimate violence, a brutal death on the cross for our sins, so we can have a fresh start and leave violence behind. If you want more on that or any of our guests, contact us by the means you see on the screen. We'd love to correspond and connect for all of us. I'm Lorna Duick. Thank you for watching and join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. Canada, we have more news for you online at Context. And these are the stories you won't see on TV, but it's a daily delivery for your phone, iPad, or computer. Here's a few of them. He was a former gang leader and drug lord. Today, he is an advocate for forgiveness and reconciliation. Author Michael Bull Roberts answers five fun questions in this web exclusive video. Context caught up with British author Luke Cauley to talk about his book, The Myth of the Non-Christian. Take a look. There's a problem for all of us. The question isn't doing away with God doesn't resolve the question of suffering. But if we have this conception of God framed through the person of Jesus, which is here is a God who suffered with you and for you and knows what it's like to be you, that actually transforms your conception of suffering. Forgiveness can often be a lengthy process. Dr. Fred Luskin leads the Forgiveness Project at Stanford University, and he shares nine steps to forgiveness that can help us move forward. Find all of that and so much more online at contextwithlorna.com.